So a little background. Um, up until a month ago, I was the biologist for all the wetlands except Kauai Nui. Uh, and the, the biologist who was the biologist for Kauai Nui got a massive promotion. So now I'm the biologist for all the wetlands on the island. And because of that, I'm learning all the different things that are going on at Kauai Nui. And that's why I think that the key to our success for keeping our endangered populations up probably lie within this watershed. And I'm excited to present it to you guys. And if you have any questions or if anybody wants to ask anything, just do. I don't like to really lecture people. Um, so I was saying I just recently taken this on. Friday we got an award and I went to this award ceremony and a woman who I was describing what I did asked why it was important and why saving a wetland is important and why saving endangered animals are important. My response was on a personal level, I've always lived in the city. I like a place that's green and quiet that I can go to. It helps me stay focused in my life. So there's that kind of part of it that's just pretty. And on the other side, I just think that we have such a unique place, this little pico that we are and these organisms and some of the wildlife that lives here deserves to have a chance to live. And if we can do something within our powers to do it, I think that's important. But as I'm going through, that's really the thing I want you guys to, everybody to kind of think about why do we value these things and why is there a need to devote resources to them? Because we get funded through all your taxpayer monies. So in theory, if nobody cared about it, we wouldn't do this anymore. So since I don't know who all is here, we're going to take it real basic. What is a marsh? This is actually a definition from one of the Encyclopedia Britannica's. Marsh is a type of wetland that is dominated by herbaceous rather than woody plants. That means there's no trees. Um, and they can also be found at the edges of lakes and streams where they form the area between the aquatics and the terrestrial. And they're often dominated by grasses, rushes, and reeds. This is important because all of our wetlands on Oahu are this, and at the exact time, same time, not this at all. Because like I said, we're such a unique place. We get the distinction of having all three of these marshes in every one of our marsh. We have a salt marsh, freshwater tidal, freshwater marsh. We have tidal marshes. And it really makes it an interesting, very difficult way to try to manage and keep these ecosystems sustained. So we have a marsh, Pohala Marsh, it's in Waipahu. And this was the first thing I thought of when I think of a salt marsh. If you look at all this white stuff right here, these are salt pockets all throughout the system. So before we built anything, before we built up Waikale or Waipahu, this was actually connected to the ocean. This would have been historically a fish pond. So we have millions of years of salt water still in that soil. Since we've built everything, it is cut off from the ocean. And this actually fills, all of these areas fill with rainwater every year. So it's fresh water input into a salt, an old salt system. So when I say it's a salt marsh, it doesn't follow the exact definition actually at all. And it's not tidally challenged at all because there's no tide connected to it. What are the weird fun things that we get to deal with because normal plants can't grow in salty environments. So freshwater marsh, um, they say it's a low-lying depression, like a lake basin. Uh, this looks like it could possibly be a lake. And this is a depression. Um, this is in Kailua, this is Hamakua Marsh. This is fresh water here. What you don't see is that this stream right next to it is connected to the ocean and it's tidally influenced in salt water. So there are breaches along the way where salt water can come in and some of these pockets are filled with salt water, it makes it a tidal salt water marsh. And then the majority is this that's filled with the rain. So again, all of them and none of them rolled into one. The only one that's somewhat close to a freshwater marsh is Kauai Nui. 
It's got two streams that feed into it and no salt water. The only reason there's no salt water is because we built the levee in Kailua. If we did not have the land, it would be the same exact system with a fresh water and salt water interface. Yeah. Do any of them have springs on the lake? Yes. Um, almost all of them to some degree, but meh, very minimal. Um, the salt marsh that you saw, the first one that I showed, has a big salt water spring. Hamakua is very small, and Kauai Nui uh, has little pockets, but very minuscule amounts now. And a large part of that is because we don't have the groundwater. We just haven't had the rain. We've come out of a drought for the last couple of years. And even though it rained a lot um, last year, like November, December, we're still way below our average rainfall. So all of our water tables are really low. So to back up even further, what I am looking at are specifically DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife Wetlands. These are wildlife sanctuary wetlands. We have other wetlands on this island that are under control of DLNR, but they're not considered a wildlife sanctuary. Um, Pohala Marsh in Waipahu. I'm actually gonna digress a little bit and talk about what a wildlife sanctuary is with this marsh specifically. It kind of outlines the intricacies of the sanctuary. Sanctuary has its own rules. It's governed by um, Hawaii regulation statutes very differently and federally protected. This marsh here was actually four quadrants, two owned by the city and county and two owned by the state. In the 90s, no, late 80s, we gave them our two portions on the interior because they wanted to build the landfill. So we said, you know what, there's already a bunch of garbage here, here have them. Well, they later determined the site was not good, so they built ash landfill, which is actually, can't see it, but it would be right here on the side. So then they gave us our two sections back in the interior. So now it's split again, two owned by the city and two owned by the state. The state owns the stream right here. As you followed it up into Waipahu, that all becomes city and county. What we did was slap a wildlife sanctuary sign on that and is deemed that because it has these endangered water birds and waterfowl. Because it is a wetland sanctuary, that means we can never develop it, we can never build on it, and we can't do anything to take away from and degrade that from the birds. So that's really important because without having that at any, without being called a, a wildlife sanctuary, you could build a building on it. You could make it a, a landfill. And if you look at all of our landfills, they're all old marshes. So it's really important to have that. The next one we've got is the big Kauai Nui Marsh. This guy's 800 acres and it dominates on the, the windward side. Hamakua Marsh, which used to be connected. This was all part of the same uh, wetland, these two. It's right across the street, but we built a road, so we blocked it off. First, we built um, the Pauli Highway and cut it in half, and then we built a levee to block one side. The final wetland that we actually actively manage is Pico Lagoon, and it ties in well with us being at Haunaumo Bay because it is a nice wetland right next to the ocean. So this section right here and all the area that's not where this house is, is actively managed for wetlands, birds. Um, this section right here is actively managed. This is a little channel and right here is all the city and county park. We don't have nesting birds here. Um, and it's a good thing. We don't have any predator control. If any of you guys live on the, uh, this east side, then you'll see that people come over with their dogs all the time, walk on the beach. The last thing we want to do is have an endangered animal have a nest on the ground and have their, their kids eaten, basically. So we've walked in with DAR, who's Aquatic Resources, and hopefully soon they're going to come through and do a fish survey in here to tell us what species exist, because all of this is still considered a wetland sanctuary. So the first thing that I see when I look at the marsh is generally the plants. I actually used to work for the city and county in urban forestry, and I'm an arborist. I used to be a horticulturalist. I love plants. 
I think that's why I like working in the marsh. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is sedges. So this is a sedge, ahuaba, native sedge. We have non-native sedges that grow. Um, generally speaking, sedges are not a bad thing because they have seeds that the birds eat, and then they use these leaves to line their nests. The next one is hala. You can see this around in a lot of places, especially on the windward side. They can grow quite tall, and they're specially adapted to, to live and thrive in marshes because of this unique root system. Nalpaca, we see it at the beach everywhere. In fact, there's some right in the front here. It grows really well in all of our wetlands. And finally, a coolie coolie, which is a small little succulent that grows on the ground. I wouldn't be surprised if it's around the premises here. The neat things with all of these species, they're all native and they're specially adapted to live near the salt spray. So they've got a thick outside so they don't die, basically. It can, yes. And that's, that's pretty prevalent over there in the marsh, right? We see a bit more of the Balcopa or I, I but this can. It just doesn't grow as quickly, so other things generally come in. And it's not invasive. It's, it's good that it's growing on top. Very good. Okay. Again, I notice it growing more and more. we can eat this, and a lot of people do. The old Hawaiian said it was a power punch because um, it's got water and salt. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I unintentionally did it or just noticed that after I had started making this um, slideshow, the size of the pictures of all of these plants really correlate with the number of species in each of our wetlands. So there's a couple of hala. There's quite a bit of nalpaca, but there's a lot of akuli kuli on these native species. Now we're going to look at some non-natives. And again, they're pretty much representing how much there are in the populations. Cattails, they only grow in freshwater systems, so they only grow in um, Kauai Nui. They're really invasive, they're hard to get rid of. The only one possibly worse is the bulrush, which is also all over Kauai Nui. There's actually a native species of this bulrush. It grows very slowly, um, and it's uniquely different in the shape of it. Unfortunately, because it grows slowly, there's almost none of it on the island. Is the bulrush only in freshwater like Correct, yeah. Um, what, what if it, could it also live in tidal with a little bit of salt? No, very, cannot That's handle. That's a strong indication of freshwater Correct. is less prevalent. Yep. Okay. The next bigger species, pickleweed. The nice thing with pickleweed, even though it um, it is invasive and it's not native. The birds can eat these and they use the stem parts of this to make a nest. So out of all of the invasives that I'm going to show, this is the only one that I think is okay and that's stretching it. So I didn't put it up here, but the number one thing that we see in every one of our wetlands, California grass. Um, you can't tell that this is over six feet high. It's super thick, and this goes for an acre. Uh, we can weed whack down to here. This was weed whacked a week and a half before. It grows really fast. We don't have the manpower to stay on top of it, but this is the number one invasive weed that we try to get rid of. And we try to get rid of it because when this grows, it's too thick for anything else. The birds aren't gonna nest there. It'll suck up all the water, so you'll no longer have a wetland. And overall, if anybody has weed whacked or mold this stuff, it really irritates when it touches your skin. So the next thing, what I consider the most intricate part of my job is the animals of the marsh. And we have dragon and damselflies. This is a damselfly. They're not all native, in fact, we have green skinners, a bunch of different kinds. I very seldom pay them attention except for if they're there or not. If they're there, that's a really good sign of a healthy waterway. If they're not, something is probably going wrong. And the next one is spiders. I did not put a spider picture up here because I am scared to death of spiders. And I work outside every single day. And if you ever see me and I'm at Hamakua, you will hear me if I see a spider because I scream so loudly. But I put up with them because of the really interesting stuff that I've learned. 
There's a gentleman who I consider a mentor. He's about 90. He worked in all 50 states managing refuges for the fish and wildlife. He found a correlation to spiders and nesting and found that before the birds nest, the water levels come up, the spiders come to the top of the plants, the birds eat the spiders, and then they lay their eggs and make their nests. Before we had all the great science stuff that we do, it was just like, okay, that's an indicator. But we found out that spiders actually are really strong in um, an amino acid called lysine, which is necessary to build eggs. So without spiders in their diets, the birds cannot lay eggs, period. So once he told me that, I now allow cane spiders and other spiders to live in the marsh. Owls. So this is actually a pueo. There are not a lot of owls within our marsh systems. We had one that lived at Kauai Nui for a year, um, recently died. I'm not really sure why. Um, they are really prevalent in the Pearl City area. I believe that they're in our Pohala Marsh, but not really on the windward side, and I'm not sure why. Uh, waterfowl. I don't have a picture of them. That is ducks. That's a nice way of saying any kind of duck species. The ducks are so interesting here because of the Koloa hybrid mallard thing that we actually have a person that that's his only job. So I cannot begin to even talk about waterfowl in just an hour. He could probably give a two hour talk on it. But do know that we do have some koloa on this island. We just picked one up from the airport and put it in our marsh in Kauai Nui. And she tested out to be 100% pure koloa. So fishes, we're wetlands, we have fishes. Um, my There's an intern who's a marine biologist. He, that was his degree. I don't really know too much about fishes, but we were at Kauai Nui and looking at along the fence line, a stream that was running, and he said, oh, look, that's the native oopu, the, the native guppy, or gobi, and sure enough, it was. So again, another reason why I want Dar to come in and kind of lend their expertise, because I'm a bird brain, as you guys are about to find out, pretty much the stuff I know are birds and plants. And then waterfowls, what funds all of this, basically, are endangered birds. And they're super cute. So I got a lot of pictures of them up here for you guys to see. So the first one we're going to talk about is the Hawaiian moorhen. Um, it goes by Galanul. Uh, the Hawaiian name is Alaiula. It's part of a rail family. Those are all over the world. It's considered a subspecies of the common Galanul, although it does have some distinct differences. Our Galanul has a red part on its leg all the time. And the shields, that's this part of the, the bill, is at least 25% bigger than any of the ones on the mainland. So there's less than 1,000 in the whole world of these type species. And they only are on Kauai and Oahu. Right now, we've got um, an expert in from Tufts University, which I believe is in Boston, doing research on these. Between us and Fish and Wildlife, we want to take off that subspecies name and consider them their own unique species because they are vastly different from the mainland ones. But these guys are omnivores. They will eat anything, plants, animals, bugs, unfortunately, rice, bread, and everything else that people feed them with. So here's just a cute picture, a mom, a dad, and two chicks. You cannot tell the difference between the males and females visually. It's just impossible. The only way you can do it is actually have the bird in hand and sex them. So here is a nice close-up picture of a banded bird. That kid from Tufts is coming through and he's banding these. It's been really useful data. We can see if they are staying in the same wetland, if they're flying, and if they are flying, how far are they going? So it's something he's just started, and we're really excited to see what the results are. The unfortunate thing is, most of the time these guys are hiding like this, and you can't see a band, or they're in the water. They're really good swimmers. And that's another really cool thing about these birds. They do not have web feet. Their feet look just like chicken feet, and they are amazing swimmers. And when they fight each other for male dominance, they actually come out of the water, and it is a full-on chicken fight 
with their feet flying, and the winner is the one who doesn't drown. So this one, I'm sorry to show it to you. This is what I see a lot of in um, Hamakua. This marsh is right next to the city. We're considered urban core. Um, people run over the birds all the time. And my big push right now is to get people to become aware of them and to stop feeding. The reason they're in the parking lot is because people are feeding them and then they're walking into the different stores and the birds follow them. The two places where I picked, unfortunately, guys were run over up, the only, almost the only places on the island, Bellows Airfield, Hamakua Marsh at the down to earth parking lot or in the road in front of it. The unfortunate <laughs> thing is that uh, they fly, so it's not a possibility. Um, we are actually in talks right now to put up a three foot fence. That's just something so people know, hopefully more, we'll put up placards so people can see don't feed, you know, this is why, showing pictures. And then plus I'll be able to put stuff out so people, I can say, look to your left and you can see a nest with four gallon old chicks, you know. But um, unfortunately we haven't been successful. The numbers have gone down since I started, uh, the mortality numbers. This was taken the first year. The first year I started, um, I was averaging eight to 10 birds run over every year. Uh, now I've only had two this year. So I think our outreach with the community, we bring a lot of kids, school kids in, has really helped because hearing from your kid why you shouldn't feed your bird, feed the birds is a lot better than hearing from me or an enforcement officer. So it is effective, it's just slow process. But that's pretty disturbing. So here's a cute picture of a chick because we never wanna end on a sad note. Okay, the next species that I really focus in on is the Hawaiian coot. Um, I like Ale Keo Keo, and it too is endemic and endangered. Um, it's considered a subspecies of the American coot, <coughs> not the Eurasian coot. Very different from that one. So the neat thing with these guys, just like the others have this shield, uh, here in Hawaii, the shield can be white or it can be red or purple or orange. On the mainland, it is only white. There was a woman at UH doing her uh, doctorate on these guys. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened to her and I haven't seen anything published, but that was the big push again to get these listed as a species instead of a subspecies. So just like the moorhens, these guys have um, chicken feet a little bit fatter because they can walk, almost walk on the water, but they're really unique. They swim, they spend all of their time in the water. And I mean, that's like us swimming all the time. We just don't, we're not adapted for it. Their numbers do better between 15 and 2100. Um, that's because they're on all four islands. So not just us and Kauai, they've done pretty well. The other interesting thing to know about these two species it was legal to hunt them as game birds up as close as 1939. And they were eaten throughout the Hawaiian Islands the whole time. In the 1950s, the numbers went down to less than 50 species. Oh, here's a picture of a nice one with a red shield. Um, and then when they get that red shield, there's a little dark spot on the bill. But yeah, so the numbers were down to less than 50 individuals in the world. And we've, we've been able to bring them up. They're considered stable at this point, which is a really good step. Now with the addition of the stuff we're doing at Kauai Nui, we're actually hoping to really increase the populations. Um, genetics. I actually have a degree in genetics. It has been my question since I started how this fits in to the bird's genetics. Is this a sex link gene that turns this color? Is this a show of dominance? Since I have started, I have never seen two red shields mate together. I've only seen white and white or white and red. Um, there's a woman with a low E uh, by LCC that has told me she has two red shields that have been mating there for the last five years. It's on my to-do list to go visually see that. I had always assumed that it was sex linked, that it was a male trait, and that it was a show of weakness. 
because what I can visually see is that the birds with the red shields get pushed out of the system or pushed into the least desirable territories. There's a chick, because I gotta have cute pictures. Now my favorite of the three endangered birds, the Hawaiian stilts. I have a dog named Foxy, he's black and white, just like these guys, super long legs. And he barks all the time, he barks when he's happy, he barks when he's hungry, when he sees people, and that's the same as these guys. As soon as they see a person, they start going chirp, 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 chirp. If you walk into the wetland, you will hear them. So another endangered uh, species, it's a subspecies of a black wing stilt. That's a North American stilt. Everybody's okay with that. We do not see anything that is that much different between the two. And it's pretty unlikely that genetically speaking, there's that much difference. The populations are less than 2000 favorably. We like to see more, but their habitat is mud. They like mud flats. They do not like any kind of vegetation. And you guys saw the size of that picture of California grass. We are just dominated with California grass. And So that's been a debate. When we had the initial people come through, they said that 60% was native species. I have been out there. I have kayaked that myself. Necky ferns is the only native species that they see. And I do not believe one bit that it's 60%. I think that a closer mark is probably 30% native, 70% invasive. So, being the lucky person I am to have this job, I was blessed with a stilt nest that was in a spot that I could drive up to and take pictures of. If you stay in your car, the birds don't care. As soon as you walk out, that's when they freak out and they leave. So I was able to take pictures from day four after they hatched up until they became adults. As far as I know, this does not exist in any literature. So you guys get to see the first set. So this is day four. Um, you can see how modeled the coloring is on the back. That's because the only thing that the chicks can do is hide. So they run into the nearby vegetation and squat down. And the parents do this awesome display where they pretend that they have a broken wing and they lead the prey away and then fly back. At day 11, there's not too much difference, although the legs have definitely gotten longer and thicker and the bill is getting bigger, and it's starting to lose some of the colorations on the back. And what I notice is the belly is getting a lot more full. Uh, skip ahead to day 15. We start seeing some actual colorings on the back. We're starting to get some feathers. This guy's about uh, half to three quarters the size of the adult. And then finally on day 20, we're seeing real feathers Three to four days later, he was what we consider fledged or adult. That means he can fly. So super cute. Nobody has ever seen this. Fern Duvall, who works in Maui, has drawn these, but nobody's ever captured them on, on any kind of media. And then this like melted my heart. Day four, the first day I saw him, it started raining. Now, when they're that downy, they can't get wet because they will die of hypothermia. So the mother, I know it's the mother because she's got brown on her back knelt down and all you can see all three sets of legs underneath <laughs> hide under her until the rain stops and i was like oh my gosh out of all the three bird species this is the only one that really shows strong uh familial attachment to the chicks the coots and the moorhens by the time the chicks are two weeks it's pretty much the parents are saying okay you know you can get out of the nest now go find on your own but these guys will stay together for a month and then they'll stay together in their family units until the next breeding year. So these guys also are the only ones that breed only once a year, every spring. The other two species nest year round, which is really helping their uh, populations grow. But these guys are nesting right now. We're expecting chicks within the next two weeks around the whole island. and. That's, again, triggered by the rainfall, which makes the spiders come up, and then they eat the spiders. Oh, spiders. <laughs> so the other thing that the stilts do that's very different than the other birds, they actually attack 
predators when they have a nest. They don't attack when their chicks are born. They do that lame, I'm hurt, um, follow me away from the chick thing. So I was surveying last week and bombarded with these guys. What they do is they go up, they go into a circle, and then they come at you and they hit you. So the other thing, I had my cell phone with me and I videotaped it. Hopefully you guys can listen and hear them physically hitting me. So that one hit me so hard I fell on the ground. And not only that, but they gained in numbers and went from two to four speed birds. Yep. Shoot. I said shoot, by the way. <laughs> That's the thing, I don't know. Oh. Um, it is an interesting thing because there is not uh, a nest that I have seen. And this is where I'm attacked. This does not have water. They nest near water. I, have, I had assumed that they had a nest in the middle because two individuals were hanging out there. But then when I went back to survey the next day, I didn't get attacked. So what you can't see is right next to the other side of the solar panel is a stream. I'm wondering if they're not just nesting in the stream corridor and then flying over to, to eat all the insects out of here. Yeah. So um, they live fairly near a golf course with lots of ponds, you know, a lot of stilts. Oh, yeah. And so are, um, are they nesting in those ponds? There's no mud flats there. I mean, They'll nest. Like they're manufactured ponds, but so in the plants, there'll be some area that they're nesting probably in it. Probably, yes. Because I counted 15 to 20 adults sometimes at certain ponds that I can go back to and see them over and over again. Oh, yeah. Um, Honolulu Country Club, I survey at. Uh, I survey Olamana Country Club. Basically, every country club that there is, golf courses, there's going to be these endangered birds because they were here nesting over the whole island before we showed up. And then, fortunately for golf courses, or unfortunately, they build the perfect habitat for these guys where you have these short grasses that are well cut with lots of bugs. If you drive a mower or if somebody's mowed at the elementary school by you, you'll see the stilts come in that shakes all the insects out of the ground and it's a smorgasbord and then you've got the adjacent tall grass which they love because they hide in that and other insects are there and then if you throw fresh water into the system you you're going to bring birds in so they're not living they're living there now they're not yeah. living in like coming over to no they're actually yeah the other thing with near Waipahu, uh we have not had rain there in a very long time the picture I have of Pohala is accurate. There has not been water in that area since December 12th. Um, but those 180 birds that usually nest there are now having to find other places to go. Um, and then if they find a spot that's suitable, they're just going to keep coming back there. So fresh water <laughs> brings up something I forgot to mention. These guys can drink salt water, but only a very small amount of salt. and the different species can handle different amounts. Um, so they all need fresh water. None of them can nest in a fully salt water area. On the levee over at Kabanui, yep. they're pumping water out of yes. the marsh. And into the stream. And into that stream. Yep. Isn't that, um, why are they doing that? And doesn't that hurt the marsh? So, this is as much as I can tell you, because that's, as the military says, way above my pay grade. Um, Koi Nui is unique in that I said we put that levee there, so we stopped all the drainage out of that system. So the water there is becoming 
kind of a little bit stagnant because the only exit it has now is out a little bit through the Oneava Canal. And you've seen that little stream that's by the levee, that's almost nothing. So as far as I know, the purpose of this um, is, it's a gravity fed, so it's not pumping, is to pull some of the water out to refresh the system. But again, so it shouldn't. Um, and wasn't the levee built to keep the water out from that's, the street? And that's, yeah. <laughs> It was built to prevent the flooding, right? I can't answer because I'm wearing this shirt right now. Oh, and I have my own opinions, but I'll it is a... Be yeah. <laughs> but it's a strange... But is, yeah. is it going to hurt the marsh? It should not, no. Um, because of where he's pumping, that's Monowilly Stream. That's the water only from Monowilly, which is doing fine right now. And as far and it's only for a couple months. This is considered a test. He does not have a, a permit from DOH. So this is the engineer's test to see if it improves water quality within the marsh and within the stream in Kaili Pulu. That's as much as I know though. Um, I went to one meeting and- What's the original source of that water? Um, the, it's in the marsh. Yeah. yeah. Coming from the marsh into, across the levee. Oh, okay. Into the stream. The built to keep yeah. it out the water. Not as not what the beliefs are, and again, we'll see at the end of this test what we actually see, because we do have a lot of water quality monitoring going on, and we'll be able to see what is happening um, if it does what it's intended or not. I don't know the geography of this. I'm from out of state. Yeah, but our marshes, even though there are strict state conservation mm -hmm. rules about what you can build where and what you can do, <laughs> the marshes are still threatened by water coming into them from sewage effluent, from septic tanks, from water runoff from streets. Yep. I realize that's an isolated area. Uh, Hawaii Kai may not be. Uh, is this a problem of, 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 of us humans being too close to these, these areas and water yep. coming in that are our fault? This is, this is a reality, yes. Um, as I go through the marshes when we get to Hamakua, uh, it, all of the street drainage is just straight into the stream there. So that's the stream that goes by the levee and then in theory out to the ocean. So it's a, there's no filter, it just it comes through. Uh, somebody, which I believe is a city and county, has a big machine that's actually monitoring that now. They started it before the target was built in Kailua. Um, so for sure that one pumps straight into the stream. The Kauai Nui is a little bit offset because of the amount of bridges that have to go over it. So I think that that one may not be so bad. Um, Pohala Marsh, the stream that's next to it is only runoff from the city of Waipahu. That's it, it's just runoff. So. As we're progressing, we are able, we're hoping to start to do more monitoring by getting UH and our community colleges involved. Because at this, at this time, we don't have the staff or the time to be able to do it. Uh, it's something I've always felt. And when I show you pictures of Hamakua and the stream cleanup, I mean, I've had huge pieces of styrofoam come through. I mean, just the, the reality is driving on a road, you're gonna get some sort of uh, gas, oil, everything else that's on that. So when it rains and that just floods right into the stream water, people generally think that it's pollution, that somebody has done something, but the reality is it's just coming off the streets. So these poor guys, that's why I'm the queen of Hamakua and Kauai Nui, because I got to fight for them. So besides our endangered birds, we get these beautiful birds that come and stay with us for a while, our migratory birds, the colea, the Pacific golden plover. This is what we consider with a full tuxedo when they get the black and the white. When they come, they're just brown. There's a lot more this year than Yes, yep. We've had a huge flush. And then I've been hearing rumors of ones in IAEA that have decided to weather over the winter here or summer here. So seeing some stragglers who just decide not to go back up to Alaska uh, wandering tattlers, ruddy turnstone. This is a curlew. I don't have a picture of our curlew, but we do have one that lives in Pohala. 
Um, the ruddy turnstone is my favorite bird out of all of these because the Hawaiian name is Akakeke, and that's fun to say, Akakeke. Uh, sanderlings, we see a lot of these. And this guy is not migratory. Um, it's a black crested night heron, the king fisherman. This guy is super smart. Um, even though I always tell people don't feed the birds, everybody feeds the birds. And I've seen him pick up the pieces of bread, drop it into the water, wait for the fish to come eat the bread, and then grab the fish and eat them. <laughs> Very intelligent birds. I mean, that's, that's using some common sense that a lot of people don't have. So yeah, the reality is there's a lot of organisms that utilize these areas and they're unique to these areas. So coots and moorhens with their fatalities at Hamakua, the threats to the birds. As you see, this is the only thing that we can change. Um, we can try to rat trap, but it's right next to a city. We're not gonna get rid of all of the rats on Oahu dogs, cats, uh, mongoose, cattle egrets. So here's some pictures of by the crosswalk, by Creekside. Um, and people fly down that road. I wish that I could put up speed bumps. We used to be lucky enough to have the cops. Uh, it would come in back into our driveway so that they could you know, monitor people. And that helped for a really long time. But I'm scared to go get these birds. People go so fast down the road. And now with the target, the traffic has almost doubled like overnight. So it is something that I'm definitely aware of and, and trying to put a lot of, get as much voices out there as I can. Slow down, try not to feed the birds. More than that, if you see a bird in the road, don't assume that it's just a minor bird and can fly away. Actually, I got a call this morning a duck was hit in the parking lot and has a broken wing that I can't go get today, but I assume it'll be there tomorrow. And the groundskeeper said he saw the person, didn't even slow down through the back, just drove right through, hit the duck as it was running out of the way. Rats. So to help protect our bird species, I deemed it super important to snap trap. And I built a nice little cage around it so the birds can't get hurt. Dogs, I captured this one myself without help from anybody. It's actually tied with a toe strap from a truck. So this guy and its mate were in the marsh. People like to cut open the fence line and let their dogs run free in an open area. And a year and a half ago, I watched somebody do the same thing in Pohala. I had 90 nests and within the amount of time, I called our predator control to ask him to come help me. The dogs had killed all but one still chick. So we had a complete failure within like five minutes. Cats, mongoose, whoops, sorry, mongoose, cattle, egrets, they're all known to eat chicks and eggs. And then crabs. I put this in because we have Samoan crabs. And I have documents of crabs pulling down ducklings. So it makes me think that they could potentially be a real hazard. So finally, let's get to our actual marshes. This is Kauai Nui. Um, this over here, this is Hamakua. This is all a hill. So the actual marsh for Hamakua is only this thin little line. Again, you can really see we are directly in the middle of a city. Fish and wildlife are lucky. All of their areas are removed. If you go up to James Campbell, you see some shrimp farmers. But because of this interface, I'm able to reach a lot more people, have a lot more schools come in, but it's also a lot more things to look out for. And as you pointed out, the, uh, the drainages that from this whole area go into the stream. So we have a couple different areas on site. We've got um, Naupohaku, which is a state park, our Kahanaiki site, which is the natural restoration, our Army Corps ponds, which look like this. They're constructed, man-made. We have um, Ulupo Heiau, the levee, which has blocked our water flow, and then Hamakoa. So this is a wildlife sanctuary? This whole green, the only green that you see in this picture, except for right here, that's a school, is wildlife sanctuary. So then, I don't remember when, but maybe a year or so ago, there was stuff in the media about um, building structures there. So that's the other thing. Um, 
I am new to the position of Kauai Nui, but this is what I can tell you. Uh, people heard structures and they flipped out. But as far as I know, we have our base yard is back here. And that's our only access to get into these areas. So we need to have buildings. Oh, no, yeah. Then that, I don't know. I'm sorry. It's the plus of being the biologist. I can tell you about biology. Um, I don't know. I do know that I was stopped earlier because uh, the Kailua Community Board has decided that they want to build a bike path through Hamakua which is never going to happen. And when the person confronted me about it, I said, well, there's no way that you're going to build a bike path through the marsh. It's just not going to happen. So then when I talked to my boss, who is actually the main boss of all of this, the branch manager, he said that the community may say one thing, but that's not what's really going to happen because there's no way that we could. He said, OK, tell them that if they want to build a bike path that goes up this hill and down through the back and not enter our marsh at all, there's no way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is 820 acres. Uh, this is really cool. Ramsar is a place in Saudi Arabia. A number of years ago, the world got together. And the world, not Hawaii deciding we're important, but the world decided that this is one of the wetlands of importance. So this has won an award um, for, this eight, for this 820 acres because we have never built on it. And that will show that we never want to. Why would we ruin that? That would automatically be like, oh, thanks for this award. Now we're going to do the opposite. <laughs> um, so we do have this managed area, which is a part with the wells, the Kauai Nui Army Corps ponds. They haven't officially given them over to us because they're not fully working yet, but I'm hoping soon. Uh, and then we'll have water control. With the wells, we'll be able to pump water in, which will help the birds maximize the nesting. And then we're working with us, scientists, educators, UH, um, and I'll show you some of the water monitoring. So we, this is for real. This is what we look at. This is what I look at almost every day. Um, we use this company and what we're looking at are temperature, pH, um, ORMP <coughs> is how much uh, electrical conduct goes through. And that can show us how much bacteria is in the system. Salinity, which almost is always zero in Koinui. Uh, and then DO is dissolved oxygen, turbidity. These are all important because it protects the birds. How often do you do your work? This is all the time. This is 24 seven. So I look at it every morning. Yeah. So what we see is places with high nitrogen, we get algae blooms. Um, we know that Hawaii's lands are super fertile. We can grow anything here. And that's because we have really high nitrogen levels. So we monitor that uh, dissolved oxygen to tell us how much algae is in there. If we see in the daytime, dissolved oxygen goes really high because there's lots of photosynthesis going on. And then at nighttime, it drops really low. That's a really bad thing because fish need oxygen to live. So if the dissolved oxygen is disappearing at night and there's not enough oxygen for the fish, this happens. We have massive fish kills. What eats the fish that are dead? Bacteria, maggots. Um, that's why I look at the ORMP, because if our bacteria levels become high, that's a really bad thing, and it can lead to uh, avian botulism. It only takes one maggot who has eaten bacteria to kill a bird, and then so every fish kill we have, I go through and I clean out all the fish by hand every time. In Kauai last year, we lost thousands and thousands of fish in our systems because of high temperature, which is another thing I monitor, and dissolved oxygen. And then we get worried because we don't want to end up with situations like this because this bird may not exhibit these symptoms and die right away. It may eat something and then fly back to the Army Corps base, and then die there. And then other organisms eat it, and we've just created multiple, multiple, multiple problems. So I kind of did a little food web, but basically this is just to show that there's a lot of things that happen in the systems that we don't know. 
and I'm working with UH NREM students to start developing a program where they're going to tell me by looking at fecal samples and water quality stuff what the fish or sorry what the birds that we want are actually eating and then LCC kids are going to do the same at our Pohala marsh and that's going to be great because it'll give us the difference between a freshwater and a saltwater so this is uh, how you guys can come in and join us in all the fun volunteering kind of event. Napohaku is a state park. They have volunteer events that happen every Saturday in Kauai Nui. It's not only beautiful, you get a beautiful trail. Sometimes they get in the water. Sometimes they work on the trail. Sometimes they outplant. Sometimes they weed. There's a lot of different things to do. And you can look on their website, the ahahui.net or just look up Napohaku. Um, this is um, on Kapa'a Quarry Road, about halfway between Pali and that H3. Kahanaiki. So this is our restoration that's natural. This is what the natural restoration looks like. We have plants that we put in, Bejardan, um, Malamas, this area generally, but this volunteer date at Koi Nui, which happens every first Saturday of every month, I'm taking the kids into this area to take weeds off all of the plants and to put mulch around the base and water them. So anybody who wants to volunteer is more than welcome to come. Um, generally, we meet behind the Castle Hospital. This is an overview of the ponds. So our base yard is right here. But I have nests here, 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 and here. So that's our only entrances. I don't want people to come in. So we're working out at our natural area. And if you want to, you can sign up down at our DLNR's iVolunteer or get a hold of me, ask our office. Just, it's every first Saturday. And then Ulupo, um, I'm not sure if they're still doing their uh, weekly restoration efforts. That's, again, state parks. Uh, Doc Burroughs, he's a great guy. He's been in this, working in this community for a really long time. If you would like to volunteer, this would be the uh, website that uh, Ahahui. And then this is my baby. Hamakua is my favorite out of all of the marshes. It is the hardest marsh we have. It, is, it takes a lot of effort to keep this clean and keep the birds, but it's also our most productive. 75 more hens were born and grew up to adults last year. In one year, when you look at 1,000 being the total amount in the world, and 75 of them are making it in this little 22 acre, it's really special. But my outreach events are very sporadic. It is generally I get a request and figure something out because we have year round nesting, this whole stream bank, and if there's water inside, it's year round. We do have some limited equipment. We can't get in the stream. It is really deep and you can't pull garbage while you're swimming. So I'm working with one of the kayak companies to see if we can start doing a regular event to do cleanups that way. And then I wanna limit the human bird exposure. But this is the army. They come out and volunteer. They help me cut down along the stream bank. This is by Creekside. It gets overgrown really quickly, and it's amazing what a few soldiers can do. Right? It's not a thing. Um, I do stream cleanups. Again, this is a limited thing. Uh, you, you can only walk in a very narrow shelf, and I only have three pairs of waders. So therefore, that's generally a student at UH who wants to do something. And then my bread and butter of volunteers are the Boy Scouts. I have worked with them three to four times. Uh, clearing, replanting, building, they're amazing. So if you want to and you have a group, just let us know and we can find something. And I think that's the end. Oh, I forgot Pohala Marsh. So that's our one on the west side. Uh, the Hawaii Nature Center has been working there doing restoration for years. I actually took a job teaching with them out of college back 10 years ago, we were some of the first crews that were going in and removing, it was a dump, it really was. Pulling out, you know, refrigerators and anything people wanted to throw in. But they have stuck with it and they do um, work uh, every last Saturday of the month. Well, maybe one month they don't, but I can't remember exactly.
but they're amazing. And if you want to get down and dirty and you're on the west side, there's somebody to go to because Valhalla Marsh is a really great, unique system in itself. But now that's the real end. So do you guys have any other things? Yes. Um, Yes. So, so those things that we test for would show up as would show any toxicity because our O R M or O R O R P will go shooting high, um, and that's it's called conductivity. And what it does is it shoots an electrical current from one pole to another. And if the current goes really fast and everything goes through, that means we have a problem. That's the, and that's what kind of tells us that we've got extra elements in the water. Uh, we have a lot of botulism or bacteria. Bacteria would be there if there's a pollution coming down from the marsh or from the, the thing on the other side of the quarry road. So it's been relatively clean? Yes. Yeah. Um, they're forced by DOH to retain all of the water, so even the rain doesn't flow down. Um, it sounds really good. However, we've lost a lot of water for the marsh that would normally have been there in the past. But it does protect Coconut Grove because none of that water can flow down to them. So they have huge retaining ponds, and any rain that comes into that system goes into the their retaining areas. Do we have any other questions? Any kind of programs to deal with all these threats, whether it's the rats, cats, dogs, the mongoose? It seems like you track for rats, but anything else? You catch dogs. Um, we actually, I uh, have a contract with USDA APHIS, and they're our predator control for all of our wetlands. I mean, Hamakua is open to the city, and rats can swim, and what I see is they just go back and forth across the stream like it was nothing. But we do active predator control for all predators. And we actually, uh, I don't know if people know, we get rid of mallards as well. If there are a greenhead mallard, we get them out of the system because we want to promote the native Hawaiian duck. But thanks. You